Welcome to The Emergence, a podcast asking the question, what is possible when we are connected and in control? Today, I have Christian De La Huerta on the show, who is the author of the book, Awakening the Soul of Power, How to Live Heroically and Set Yourself Free. I discovered Christian through a service called Podmatch to help podcasters and guests find each other. When Christian offered to come on the show, of course, I was interested, but I was also hesitant to bring on a guest just to discuss a book. And this is not what the emergence is about, but there was something about the title that intrigued me, even though I didn't understand where he was coming from with the phrase soul of power. After reading the book, I now get the title. Power is not inherently bad. It is what we do with it that counts. My favorite quote from the book, it really hit home with me, which is, so you want to be a courageous explorer? Dare to go within. Now, this is at the very fabric of how we could build more resonant communities, how we could help build better societies, to tap into the potential of what lies within people to help themselves and others. My question is, how could communication technology help awaken this solar power within us and the communities we live in? So let me bring Christian on to learn more about his book and maybe unpack a few ideas of how technology may be able to help. So how are you doing, Christian? I'm doing great, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And I, I love the introduction and the way you framed it. Uh, oh, good. Discussion. Good. Well, thank you. I like to surprise people a little bit just so I can get their natural reactions to it, <laughs> being too prepared for it. So, uh, so towards the end of the conversation, I'd like to dig in about technology, but I really want to start in about your book, which I really, really enjoyed quite a bit, quite a bit. So uh, why, don't, why don't we start off with telling me a bit about your background and what inspired you to write the book? Well, I was born in Cuba. Um, I lived there in a communist regime for the first 10 years of my life, which, you know, I write that it's kind of interesting that I'm writing about personal empowerment when I come from such a, a hierarchical power structure, um, you know, from a in a communist totalitarian regime where there is very little personal power, where the state pretty much owns you and tells you what to do and what you're going to study and what you know there's so many liberties that we take for granted here in the us that are just not available um and then also i was raised in a very catholic environment so another hierarchical power over institution in which one is told what to believe what is right what's wrong um, and there's very little flexibility around that um so interesting again that, I, that i'm on a journey and have been on a journey to not only do it for myself but help other people step find a way to step into their power and and i think the inspiration to think about this came from two areas one was my older sister um you know i'm one of nine kids so they're by evidence of, of the catholic upbringing my yeah. sister is two years older and you know, she was one of these natural born leaders when we were growing up. She she bossed around not only the nine of us, but the <laughs> entire neighborhood of 15, you know, 20 kids. And not in a, it was just a very natural thing. Like she would say, oh, let's go do that. And everybody would just say, yeah, okay, let's go do that. When she hit puberty, something happened. Like she, she just turned that thing off. And I don't know whether she got that from, where somebody actually said something to her, or whether she just picked it up from osmosis that women didn't behave in that way. Uh, but she turned it off and, and she assumed this kind of, you know, Mother Teresa uh, personality. And so that, that was always kind of in the back of my head because I know that she's not the only woman who's, who suppresses power. And, and by the way, not only women do, um, you know, men do as well, but I think women have an additional layer of, stuff that they have to work work through in terms of um, getting clear about our relationship to power because um, well uh, let me tell you the other the other thing that that inspired it is um, I had a couple of years you know a few years ago maybe eight years ago or so I had submitted a a proposal to a literary agent in New York and she said yeah great I want to work with you but I want to see some of these marketing ideas implemented before we pitch a publisher and I don't know if, you, if, if you've ever seen a, a book proposal, but it's like a huge term paper with a huge marketing analysis and who's the audience and why are you the person to write this book and how, what is your plan for reaching this audience, et cetera. And so when she said implementing the marketing plan, that would have probably taken me a year. So like slammed on the brakes and for like a few days, 
like it kind of sent me into question into crisis because i was already spending the advance in my mind oh sure and (laughs) and but it was a really really helpful process because i eventually asked myself if i weren't writing for an advance if i were just writing like what would i really feel compelled to write about and like after three days it just dawned on me about a month before sitting in meditation for only the second time in my life I heard audible words, like actual audible words, and there were the soul of power. And I got up, I was like, huh, what an interesting concept. And I got the URL and forgot about it. Flash forward, you know, flash forward a month later when I'm in this crisis moment, and it was one of those palm of the hand to the forehead moments. It was like, duh, you know, if I've been saying for years that the empowerment of women is the single most important thing that happens in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, then what am I what am I doing about that specifically? And and to be clear, I'm not idealizing women. I'm not putting women up on a pedestal. I'm not adding more stuff for women to have to clean up and clear up in in this world. It's because as a world, as a species, we've been running very off balance in terms of power dynamics, and and that system is not working for anybody, including men. Um, and we can talk about that too. Absolutely. Uh, so power, you know, soul, soul of power, empowerment of women, like, how do we do it in a different way that is not this hierarchical power over, I'm going to push you down and step on you, um, in order to prop myself up and feel powerful and, and the kind of power that is fear, force, domination, control, manipulation, how do we do power in a different way? And that's when I started thinking about all this. Yeah, and that is that really <clears throat> is brilliant because when I very first, like I said, in my intro when I when I saw the title of your book, The Soul of Power, I Awakening the Soul of Power, I just I didn't really grasp it, and and, and not that people wouldn't, but it's uh you know the way that I have my podcast and my writings over a number of years, it's about the emergence and it's really about empowering the individual. And as I started to read your books, like yeah, that's because it's one thing to see a title, and it capture your attention. It's another thing to really resonate with deep within you. And I know that there's a lot of themes in your book about deep inside. And, and that's everything I write about. I'm just, I just talk about technology, being able to tap into it. You're talking about what resides in us. And I think there should, I think there should be a, a meeting place between technology and what you write about. Um, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and the soul, I mean, the soul of power. I mean, when you're really just dig into that, that, and when you talk about the matriarchal and you talk about the women, I, I can't agree with you more because really when you think about society over the next hundred years, 200 years, I mean, women are the ones who birth. So there's that, that bond that exists. And if you strengthen that bond, then the men and the women coming from that will, will also strengthen and therefore we'll have a stronger society. So the soul exactly. power is amazing. Yes. Exactly. And, and it's, you know, it's just the way that I think about it, like thinking strategically, like what is one thing that are going to impact everything else that we're facing as a species? And that's what I land on. When women are in 50% of power, we're going to have a very different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and how we treat the environment and social justice and wealth distribution and all of it. So, so for me, it's just strategic. Like, like, like I mean, and of course, the way that we have that women have been oppressed is just like absolutely no longer acceptable. It's like way overdue for for a correction, for a course correction. And here's the important part for men to realize that um, men are also paying a power for for this for this system of you know whether you call it toxic toxic masculinity, power over hierarchical thinking. Um, it doesn't work for many either. So let's look at some numbers quickly. Um, in this country, women outlive men by five years, globally by seven years. <clears throat> you look at the rates of suicide in the US, men commit suicide four times as frequently as women. And 70% of the suicides in this country are committed by middle aged white men, which are still the 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 main repositories you know the main holders of power in this world so what's up with that what 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 is wrong with that picture why why is that the case and i think that part of it is because we we've gotten this twisted idea in our minds about what it means to be man a man 
and, and 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 what it means to be a woman so we've anything that's we have labeled feminine we have turned into weakness whereas like wait a minute you, you want to talk power you, let's talk about the power of creation that resides in a female body um and then everything that we've so so what happens is that men have concluded like ever since we were boys you're know, like little boys don't cry so so we we walk around like this uncaring unfeeling robots or at least on the outside and we are so inept in dealing with our emotions that we just suppress them we, we run away from the emotions because somewhere along the way somebody decided that that was weakness it's like wait a minute the emotions are not weakness they're not strength they're not good they're not bad they're just energies like everything else in 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 creation what used to be spiritual teaching that everything is energy now we know from quantum physics that everything is in fact energy that includes the body that includes the emotions we know energy cannot be destroyed so just because we suppress it and we don't allow ourselves we 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 don't allow ourselves to deal with our emotions that stuff doesn't go away it's it sticks in the in the in the in the tissues of our body and we walk around with layers upon layers upon layers of unresolved and suppressed emotional crap which then we try to have a relationship in the in the present moment and it's all getting filtered through that lifetime of suppressed emotional crap and unresolved past trauma it's like it blows my mind how any relationship can work because we haven't been taught how to how to hold them how to approach them and we haven't been taught how to how to clear ourselves from all that repressed emotion which by the way has to come out has to come out one way or another so it's either gonna we suppress we suppress we suppress and then finally the wrong person just rubs us in the wrong way at the wrong moment and boom explode we explode inappropriately and we cause harm to our relationships or we suppress we suppress we suppress that energy has to come out it's going to start seeping seeping out in physical symptoms heart attacks cancer ulcers so so there's just no way around it we've got to we've got to 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 learn how to how to master our emotions which means being able to feel them and and learning how to communicate them in a responsible courageous and graceful way um which to me it's nothing less than than mastery not it's so the opposite of weakness yeah absolutely and and the uh the, the, the whole mastery thing to me is that's where I come with technology. It's a tool set. Um, and what you're saying is, is really powerful because the thing that I, I feel is that it is that if it's that energy that it really there, you have the kind of the male dominant and the female mo dominant, but then there's, there's layers of culture and skin color outside of that and, yeah. and where we come from. And this is really beyond because if we if we see our true selves, we will then bypass the color and and we will bypass the religious background and or the no religion. It's it's and the one thing that I really want to kind of hit on is the fact that what I try to do, I always try to play the middle on things. I really try to exercise both sides other than the extremes. I just don't have any room for the extremes, but, <laughs> but it's, it's the, the fact of what can I, you know, I have friends that I went to high school with and I see them on Facebook and they're Marines and they're kind of hurrah fellows, right? So there's a lot of, uh, and when you see with our elections in the past and, and I, I really want to speak to them as well. I don't, I don't want to just speak to the people that are naturally inclined to it. And that's what I, I kind of get out of your book on some of the stories you're telling is that this is a something to bring people in it's not to threaten their masculinity it's not to threaten anything it's about the fact of of it, could there be tool sets for you to really explore where the strengths that you had to go fight a war I, I i think you talk about this in the book you know the strengths that you have to fight a war what could those be what could those do to be able to uh fight injustice or to fight uh even with your relationship with your uh, your significant other to be able to overcome some things so I, I really want you to kind of bubble up on that a little bit yeah that's beautiful paul that's a beautiful way of framing that the way you just did um yeah of course it's not about making men wrong it's, of course not um and you know the, the way you're talking about humanity is like our dna is 99.99% the same. Yes. So we talk about different races, that doesn't even cut it, right? There's not enough difference in terms of DNA to be considered a different race. So literally, we are one human race. Um, the variations are so superficial. 
And and interestingly, we share 96.4% of our DNA with chimps. Yep. And 50% of our DNA is identical to bananas. <laughs> so so let's begin to expand the sense of of interconnectedness that that is a reality um on this on this earth. Um and, and yeah, so that's why I added specifically a chapter. So like some a lot of the book is is has a focus on, on the empowerment of women, but we can't leave men behind. And and which is part of the reason so many men are struggling is because because of technology and, and so many jobs that are being either outsourced or replaced by machines. Um, and as women are reclaiming their power and more than 50% of college graduates today are women. So the wage gap is being reduced. Um, and so as women are st as stepping into, into their potential, a lot of men, but because of all those reasons, are feeling kind of left behind or, or they're losing their footing. They don't, they don't know who they are anymore. If, if, if my spouse, if my wife makes more than I do, then who am I when my identity is so connected to being the provider? And so, so that's why there's, that's why in, in, there's so many men in particular that are holding on to old ways of doing things things you know like the, the the way it used to be in the 50s which didn't work it didn't no. work it mainly worked for for a very few people at work not for the rest of humanity um but it's this idealization about the way things used to be um, and then the problem is that they they blame immigrants for example or people that d don't look like them um, as the source of the problem. Well, the problem is way more complex than that. And, and so much of the jobs are not being taken over by other people because a lot of the immigrants are taking jobs that Americans don't want to take. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a complex issue, but, but it's really to like scapegoat part of the, what the problem is rather than looking at ourselves. So part of what I try to do in that chapter is like, wait a minute, dudes, what does it mean to be a man like there is so much that that it means to be a man that is more than being a provider and and there are so many other ways in which you can provide like you know what what about providing um, a, a sense of safety creating an oasis of safety in your home a place an environment in which everybody all the family members can thrive and grow and and become who they are or or the explorer like you were talking about you know like there's few places left in the world that there haven't yet been explored unless we go like way deep in the ocean or out into into outer space but what about the the inner world like for the most part remains vastly unemployed unexplored and that's where all the answers to all our questions are and and if we want to be free, if we want to like really step into our power, if we want to step into our purpose and fulfill our unique human potential, we've got to be willing to go inside. There's no way around it. Yeah. And and I like to do thought experiments once in a while. So I'm on top of my head now. I, I think about the most extreme case of of somebody that would be difficult to explore their power. You know, somebody that is a quadriplegic, that is uh, of, of color, that is gay, that is living in a in a in a ghetto somewhere, and uh, you know has had all these behavioral traits that have been impounded on them, that have been you know placed on them by their family. And to me, that person has enormous potential that is inside of them. But who was asked? You know, that that's my point. Who's asking? <laughs> you know, right. it, it, and where are they asking the question? Are you are you of service to us in a general, or what is of service to you and to others? I mean, those little specific things that that person could have a thought process that somebody on the other side of the continent could have extreme value with. You know, they they could solve a genetic code of you know helping a scientist dig into something where that that scientist is missing a pattern. Uh, to be of recognition and something that resides within that person that is just very unique 
If you align that to that other person that has that need, they all of a sudden are validated. They all of a sudden have self-worth. And you talk about validation and self-worth quite a bit, which I absolutely love. So, you know, are we exploring the general? Are we trying to find a, what, you know, bro, what do you have for me? Or, or, or is the fact of what's within you and not in this teary eyed way It's like, you know, <laughs> what, what, what really resides within you that can, what's your self-worth and then not only how is that going to help you, but how is that going to help others? And if we, if we start to kind of decode that uh, through efforts such as yours and writing and, and as well as building the technology to help us decode that, to find those strengths, because in that person who's a quadriplegic who's of color that is, is in a uh, depressed area, they might find something of value and that value returns to them and they start to grow and they start to feel that they're a part of something. And then they might end up being one of the most powerful people around because they came from such of such a place to where they overcame it and then what could what lessons could they bring to others to help you know fulfill that that connection and when you say you're talking about interconnectedness that is and that's where when i really I started reading your books like man that is it the soul of power it's that interconnectedness when we reach deep inside yeah and, and that's the, the one of the ways in which technology can really support us is it's in that interconnectedness the the internet like i mean what what talk about a global brain um and 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 talk about you know ways of like what you what you used to have to you know walk out of your life and go off to some far away monastery or ashram to get morsels of wisdom now it's just like available to anybody on the internet um and we have ways of, of connecting with each other that just boggle the mind like going back to this example that you're you're giving like how many youtube pieces have we seen videos have we seen on on people who have overcome insurmountable obstacles yep. and we see it right there in front of our eyes um, you know people accomplishing in incredible feats you know painting people who have no arms and no legs and painting with 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 their 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 mouth just incredible incredible stuff which is very inspirational and it's also it also calls each and every one of us to our greatness because one one thing we know is that life is going to continue throwing curveballs our way like yeah. that we can count on and there isn't a thing that we can do about that but what we always always have choice about is how we show up in response to that and because as long as we're whole if we're on a good if we're on a journey of personal empowerment as long as we're holding anyone or anything outside of us responsible for our state of being, right? So, so we we blame our our happiness or lack thereof because mom did this or dad wasn't there or the teacher or the minister or society or or sexism or racism or homophobia, and not to deny that those things things are are, are there and have an effect, and that the system is stacked stacked against some people more than others. Yes, not denying any of that, or not denying anything that happened or any trauma that anybody ever experiencing, and. When we reframe it in that way, it's like how will I show up in response to the curveballs that life could, will continue to throw my well, my way? That's very empowering, as opposed to 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 always, you know, as long as we're holding what it, what somebody did or or the way the system is responsible for our state of being, we just gave our power away. Yes. Yes. And then, you know, on the other side of that coin too, of my, of my thought experiment is on the other side of how people perceive it, the, the empathy. So you, you write about empathy, which is a, a you know, and which ego gets in the way of which you write about. And, you know, so a, a, a traditional worker, a, a, a traditional employer sees that person in my thought experiment that's a quadriplegic and, and is of color and, and doesn't have money. And, you know, in, until we use these tools, to uh, be able to help everybody see the value. And that, that's, I think that the things that's missing, and that's one of the things I really talk about and write about in my essays is the fact of this connection is highly uh, uh, influenced um, to where, you know, we're, it's, it's pushing information to us as opposed to pulling it from us. And if, if we had a better tool set for people to really have a better understanding of who that person is on that thought experiment and what value is that 
to allow them to see that. You know, another example that I've talked about in my podcast past is, uh, past is uh, George Floyd and Derek Chauvin. And, um, you know, there's no easy solution to that. You can talk about reform the police and all of that, and that's great. Um, and I, I do agree with that 100%, but it's how you reform the police and, and you know, the training and how, how are how do they see and and you know also how does the community see them so it's always both sides is that how mm -hmm. is george floyd seeing the police because what has he been through for 20 to 30 years of his life it's like yeah he was he was on drugs I mean, why was he on drugs and so somebody could say well he was just on drugs well i'm sorry to me that's just not enough i would like to understand you know what was his upbringing and if we're if we're going to move forward we've got to have a better understanding of what resides so that we can start to really fix it as opposed to paint over it with a with a roller brush of of uh, judgment uh, of how we see these things it's like seriously what could be done to help the police have a better understanding. And that's not going to be a magic pill. Believe me, I know that things are difficult on the street. I'm not questioning that, but, but, uh, you know, they're training when they're trained. I mean, are they trained from companies who are these contracts? I mean, uh, are these tools built by the communities to, for training for police, you know, or, or is it a big billion dollar company that has a software contract? I mean, I, I'm not judging, I'm not saying so, but I would like to find out. That's one of my missions on police reform. I want to get into the details of where the training comes from, how it's done, and is it involved with the community? Because ego, you know, like you talk about, it with Derek Chauvin, that, you know, that, that gets in the way of understanding situations. And uh, that's a powerful piece is that how we interpret signals from somebody else and how we judge. I do it. I judge people. I, I'm, I really I, I really try to say that I don't, but I'm human. And, yeah. um, you know, we all are. So talk a little bit about ego and how that gets in the way of us being able to understand and empathize. Yeah. And, and yeah, I love it. And I love the way you think, uh, Paul. Thank you. Um, and I and actually, I think that visual you, of of that you just we we're just talking about is is it's a great visual of, of talking about this relationship to power because we we've, we've all got this ambivalent relationship to power we want it but we're afraid of it uh, we think we might abuse it and and no wonder um you know we got to do is uh, on any given day turn on the news and witness at least one abuse of power uh, including the one that we were just talking about um so add to that that we we have been conditioned to believe that power is a negative thing. Power is bad. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. What they didn't tell us, though, is that that quote originally was talking about political power, not personal power. Yeah. And then add to that what we were saying about the emotions, that we, we've labeled them weakness. We run away from our emotions. We, we run away from our feelings. We, we hate confrontation. We hate conflict. And when you put all that into a mix, what happens is we give our power away. The, our inherent power that nobody can give to us, nobody can take away from us, we are the only ones who, who give it away. And, and the sad part is that we give it away for the wrong reasons and for unsatisfying reasons we we settle we play small um we, we settle for less we we give our power away for an illusion of security for a false sense of security and and for morsels of pseudo love and and so the whole message of the book is that there is a way that we can step into power that is not hier hierarchical that is not power over that is not power that that is expressed by fear or force or domination that doesn't require for us to push anybody down and put our knee to their neck in order for us to prop ourselves up prop ourselves up and feel powerful like that there is a way to express express power in in a way that is a match that is congruent with who we are and and so to get to that place, there are two things that are that are critically important. One is understanding the difference between power, between worldly power and or, or what I, or ego power um, and soulful power. And the the conversation about ego is a huge conversation. It's like it's the third, the first third of the book is all about that. It's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a constant in every one of my retreats because if we if we want to have a relation relationships that can have a chance of working if we have to if we want that sense of personal empowerment if we if we want to have a life that is filled with meaning and purpose we've got to understand what the ego is because that is the, the source of all our suffering and you know we don't have time to really dive into it now but a great metaphor that the great image that that helps 
understand what the ego is, is if you put a baseball in the center of a stadium, that's what the ego is. <laughs> Who we are is the stadium. And, and we've allowed this tiny part of, of who we are, this tiny aspect of our minds to think that it is all of who we are and to make choices, critical, important, consequential choices about our lives, about our professions, about our relationships from its very small, limited, and always fear-based perspective. So we've got to understand what the ego is so that we can break free from its, its self-made prison of, of fear and lack and limitation. Well, and that is exactly it for the fact that, uh, you know, it's ego is buried in our more or less our primordial brain to some degree, you know, there are brainstem that, you know, it's not really attached as much to the frontal cortex that has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. It's, and that's the thing about the way that these quote unquote, uh, powerful institutions have built these tools for us to find and discover information are heavily are heavily influenced towards our ego or heavily influenced towards our reactive mind and uh that's the the, the it, it plays off our lowest common denominator and yes. and and what the thing is and somebody would say why why would they build tools like that what's the what's the purpose of that well our ego is easier to monetize and it's just it's it's hard to argue against that our reactive mind is easier to monetize we go buy things that we don't need i'm guilty you know we read <laughs> things that we read things that we are that we don't necessarily need we watch movies that are not empowering us or even entertaining us fully because it just they want us to scrape off the top and i say they i don't think it's this grand conspiracy theory i just think it's human nature and it's until we nature. and it's until we break nature. the chain of this Yes. where it and and so the tools and this is one of my overarching questions about this is that people like you should be highly involved with these technologies built forward now you're not going to get you know meetings with facebook and all that you can but their algorithms are going to do what they're going to do because they're going to monetize that part of our brain it's just it's what creates profit it's just the way that it has to be but my the thing about the emergence is to inspire a group of people to build technologies outside that and i've had a couple of people on my show before that are building these technologies and i want to have more in the future but when we build these tools i highly recommend they talk to people like you <laughs> do, do you see what i mean to be able to yes. as opposed to building technology to create something we build technology to help understand so that we can create something I, I think we're missing that what's been built is missing that that piece no i think you're absolutely right i think you're actually at, at the cutting edge of thinking in all this paul um and, and it's exciting and i'm glad you, and i'm glad that you've you've placed yourself in a kind of a nexus point where you can weave and connect um people because so many different people are coming to you um so so thank you for that and then i celebrate and honor your your mission and the emergence Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, you know, like, like, here's a, a tiny example of, of, of how to use technology. Like when I, like a couple of years ago, I started thinking about, you know, how can I, how can I get this message out in a way that's more piecemeal, right? Because we're so distracted by, by life. We like, there's, we live in such an ADD society. There's so many things pulling our attention in different directions and we're overwhelmed with information, with sensory information. We're like bombarded with, with media and emails and texts. It's like, it's crazy <laughs> the way that we live. So, so then I thought, all right, like, forget about a book. <laughs> Most people are never going to read any book. How can I, how can I, how can I impart this information in a way that that can actually get to people? So I thought, you know, for I thought, how about a nap? Um, and how about if I could put the deliver the information in piecemeal, in bite-sized pieces, and using the concept of concept of apps and and gaming? How how can I turn this into? How can I gamify it? How can I? turn it into an interesting way to keep people connected and, and people wanting to dive deeper because it's confrontational work, right? We're asking people to, to, to go within and to look at, at their shadow and, yeah. and to face yeah. their inner demons. 
an incredibly worthwhile effort because on the other side of that is freedom. But for most people, they're, you know, they're, it's easy to, to go la, 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 and like, oh, let's go watch another movie or, or, or another football game or something and, and not think and, and to run away from, from who we really are, which is not a very effective strategy because all the problems that we're trying to run away from and sweep under the rug, none of that stuff goes away. That's still there impacting the quality of our life and the quality of our relationships. Um, so, but anyway, I have the, the, I kind of, the app is still in development, oh. uh, but but here's how here like like this points to what you're talking about because just thinking in that way. When I wrote this book, all the 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 thinking that went into the app, I I put into place with the book. So rather than having longer chapters, like I did with my first book, so like each chapter was like a term paper kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, in this book because I went through this thinking process of, of how, to, how to increase participation, the chapters are all very short. Yes. And they all have power practices at the end that are designed to get people thinking, right? And, and to not only thinking, but to apply the teachings to, to their lives, because that's what's gonna make sure that it doesn't stay at the level of an information, but that it actually ensures transformation which is the whole reason to, to take the time to read a book so that our lives change and get better and the quality of our relationships improve. Um, so, so that, and then like another use of technology, I, this year, like last year, because of the pandemic, I had all my retreats came to a screeching halt. I've been doing retreats for, for 30 years. Oh. And I went from a hundred thousand miles on an airplane to zero. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I had to pivot, you know, quickly and, what I've actually known for years that I needed to do if I was going to scale and reach people who may, may never come to one of my retreats, it's like COVID forced my hand to do it. And so I used that same thinking from the app and I, I applied it to a year-long coaching program that, again, technology makes this possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, I'll go back to doing retreats whenever we can, and I've already scheduled some for the end of the year. And I've also noticed in the past that somebody comes to one of my retreats and they have this amazing, profound, life-changing experience, an expansion of how they view themselves and, and the relationship to life. Um, and if they don't have a support system when they go back home, if they don't have some kind of practice, it's very easy to get sucked, that sucked into the day-to-day -day and all the distractions that we were just talking about. And pretty soon, that contraction, I mean, that expansion begins to contract and the old voices of fear and self-doubt and the self-sabotaging behavior start creeping up again and pulling them down. And then they got to come to another retreat. What I love about this concept of, of the yearlings, I stretch out the teachings over the period of a year. So deliver them piecemeal, a little bit of content every week. But here's the difference. Here's the key, that interactivity and the gamification, right? so that there are practices um, that, that again, designed to, to integrate them into, into their lives. And then a system of accountability, because we all need, we all need the support because, because of it's so easy to get distracted. Um, and, and, and because inertia, inertia is such a powerful force, um, in our lives. So the accountability is two levels of it. One is coaching calls with me every two weeks. And then in the, in between weeks, they have, small pods you know two three people power pods we you know i call them and it could be that could be just a five minute call but it's just like hey did you do what you said you were going to do just to keep sure that that support and accountability going yeah that's that's absolutely and and um you know when you're talking about your app and and these things is that uh, in your book there's so many you use the power of stories um, and I don't know if you're familiar with some of these historic technologies. There's Douglas Engelbart who invented the mouse, but he also did something called the mother of all demos. And there's Vannevar Bush that uh, wrote an essay called As We May Think. And it's they proposed these systems of connectivity before the PC was built that 
is more of an interconnected within within documents as opposed to going to a book and then reading the whole book. It, they, they envisioned a future of our connection was within what we think as opposed to just you know, whenever I talk to you, I don't talk, we don't talk about paragraphs, right? We, we, we right. reference, when we remember our conversations, we remember to a certain thing. We don't say, oh, I've got to go to page 23. So, and, and um, you know, one thing I was thinking about within your book, the story of, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Mao, Mao, uh, your guru that you had. Oh, a, Maya, Maya. Maya. Yeah. And, um, and that, that story in of itself when I think about that being broken outside of that book, that other people could relate to your journey with her and then what you learned with the breathing exercises and, and, and how that ended up where she ended up not wanting to be a guru, that the arc of that, uh, you know, not everybody that's going to read your book is necessarily going to relate to that, but of the people that would relate to that could be an introduction to your book. So breaking those little narratives out, and like you said too, with instruction and and you know and, and recapping and and things like that, is that that is the power of these stories of of you know you have your own behaviors that was modeled by your situation with your family and what you had to do that imparts the way that you see the story and the way that you tell the story, but other people, there's other people out there that could really relate to that and resonate with them, so where that could be an introduction into your other thoughts. It, do you see what I'm, I'm saying is that if we introduce ourselves to the power within, then it could introduce us to other things to keep us interested, to keep us flowing, as opposed to, okay, chapter 23, chapter two, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I think I'm getting it. Let me, let me, let me ask you this to see if I'm getting it. So rather than like what these guys were envisioning, I know I didn't know their work, but it's, I'm fascinated about what you're saying. So this is what I'm hearing you say. Let me know if this, if I'm getting okay, your sure, explanation. Sure. So are you saying that rather than have a sequential book that because we don't know the models, because that sequential process is not the way that doesn't mirror the way that we normally learn so that what you're seeing the possibility of is, is a, I don't even know how, what you call it, but, but I guess let's call it book for lack of another word, but that would, you could access different parts of it non-sequentially, and then they would take you in a different path. Yes. And that's already being, that has been built and, and that is, you know, it's, it's, hi, it's hyperlinking when you, okay. So when you go to a, a web page, uh, when you search on Google, it doesn't hyperlink you to within the page. It, it, it takes you to the beginning of the page. Now there is technology that that you can code that, but you, you think about these paragraphs that would think about the most inspirational paragraph you've ever written, not even this book. All right. And then you think about the meat of what went behind that, what you had to live to be a part of that. Mm. And, and so, you know, of the, the first thing that somebody discovers Christian on, <laughs> you know, the, 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 just the core of who you are and they discover that and then they don't, okay, buy a book on Amazon for, you know, 1999. I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad at all, but by the way, I'm, I'm, you know, rethinking the future of the web is, right. is, is, you know, what deeply resides within us and what's the context that surrounds that paragraph. And I'm not saying they don't read the book, but what I'm saying is that they come across that paragraph and they learn more about you and then the books that you've written they are now because of that paragraph or sequential sequences of paragraphs take you take them to the book that most relates to them that you've written so as opposed to uh here's christian here's the books choose from them here's christian what he thinks and then let's help you map the best book. And then they might end up reading all your books, but maybe not all of them do. Maybe it's not all. I mean, everything I say is not going to be relatable. And some could argue not, not much. <laughs> I, I'm a little bit out there. Obviously, you figure that out, but uh, <laughs> which I embrace it, man. I, I love it. I, I don't apologize for it at all. I am who I, I am. I love it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. So so it's just this interconnection. This That's what the emergence is. I, you know, when, and if, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of what uh, how I came across the emergence because i think you'll really get it but no i would love that and by the way you're expanding my way about how to how to impart a message oh well thank you forward. yeah and you're helping me i mean that's what this is about man this is this is this is not just one-sided i mean when i read your book it blew my mind it really did and and uh it because it and, and this is a thing about the emergence so i've been writing about this stuff for 20 20 years i've been thinking about this stuff for 20 years and and uh, my wife 
told me, she's like, what are you, you know, everything that you talk about all these years, it's like, you're so depressed over because you can't get out. Why don't you start meditating? And I, you know, three years ago, I said, okay, I give because every time I try to come up with something, it's just, it just feels like I'm just talking against a wall. And uh, she goes, no, just, just start meditating and think of a flow of water. And boy, as soon as she told me that, it's like, oh my God, she goes, you don't need to be part of the flow. Maybe these ideas are out there and maybe you need to meditate to slow your mm. brain down. And I said, I don't have a slow brain. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I started meditating and it took me about a year. And then I went to a bookstore, Bookman's in Phoenix, and I was so incredibly just kind of depressed over the whole thing where I couldn't get what I was thinking about into a plan, you know, into a, just an idea that was consumable. And so I told myself my meditation, I'm going to go to this bookstore. And the first book I uh, put my hand on is going to help me take me in that direction. And so I, and it sounds, I put it in my intro on my podcast, but it sounds so weird, but I meditated outside. I went in there. I found a section that's probably going to be more relatable and technology and business. And then I just literally closed my eyes and put my hands on the book called the emergence, the connective lives of ants and, and the collective uh, lives of ants. Yes. And cities and building cities. So huh. I would highly recommend you read this book. It's, it's, fascinating and it's about the fact of the ant communities work without the instruction of the queen ant they provide pheromone trails to connect with each other to be able to let them know uh you know where is the best place to bury the dead where's the best place to hide the food they don't get that instruction from the centralized governing force of a queen ant they get it from each other mm. and and uh that's why okay man that's exactly what i've been thinking of but i didn't know what it was you know mm. i don't you've obviously had these before where there's something that is what it is that you've been thinking about forever and you don't really know how to articulate it i mean how can it become an idea if you can't articulate it yes <laughs> and uh that's what i really that's why you helped me with your book because there were several ideas i was able to get that you articulated that i hadn't thought of and i'm going to reread it again because uh, i want to have more time to really make some better notes towards the end i, I kind of cheated and i just made some quick notes because i was running out of time but i really want to <laughs> dig into that again and i'll read some more of your books but you know that's that's what i'm talking about that interconnected the paragraph is that pheromone trail from another ant and and if it really if the and the way they do that is that the stronger the chemical trace the more that the other ants will go to follow them and so, but it's not coming from the queen ant. You see what I mean? If the queen ant is, is instructing them to follow, then just the sheer measure of power is going to, it's just going to want to monetize them. You know what, I mean? monetize yeah, them for power, for money. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, I mean, exactly. But you're talking about the difference between power over versus power with. Um, and I love that. And I love that your star, your story embodies what we're talking about too, because the way that you approach this the way that you got to the emergence was by going within and by yep. and by accessing your your intuition your inner knowing which is all the realm of the stadium yes. not the ego like if you had said said you, you, you if you had said you go, okay uh, like if you had approached this logically strategically from the level of ego planning that there's no way you would have landed on that um yeah, whereas exactly. where you, with in, the intuition you're just like bam we're right for the book that you needed at that particular point yeah and you hit on that the way that you wrote your book too i mean that's it's it's so true it's so true within all of us and and uh you know my wife and which I, i'll be candid with you i'm actually separated from my wife and it took that separation to realize how good of a friend she was so so and is so I, I, you know, that's, that's the, the person that helped me unlock this at that time, I was going through a separation at that very time. And, and, you know, sh the person that, you know, I was no longer going to be with uh, at that level is the very person who helped me the most. And, and I can't even tell you how much I love my, you know, we're, we're not divorced, but we're separated. And, but I, I it, it's that, and that's the thing is that I, I did, and she would teach me about ego. And I've, I've always had that, you know, well, I'm going to create something so special in the future. I know it. She'd heard me talk about that crap for so, so long. And, and she was the one to really uncover that for me because it is ego. I was, I was sitting there overthinking it and I still overthink, ask all my friends, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm a notorious overthinker, but you know, I use some of that for thinking. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just, I, 
ego absolutely got in my way because I had built technology in the past called Quired.com with a with a friend and a another partner, and um, that was all about ego. When I did that, I spent money. It was just I, I you know, my my tagline was "Move you forward." And I was going to build this platform back in 2005, six, seven, uh, eight, nine. <laughs> and uh, it was about moving people forward. And I reflect back on that. And that thing was so steeped in my own ego to where I was trying to build something that I didn't even know what it was. And I was spending money on it. And, you know, I and that was the reason I had to meditate because I was so frustrated on the failures that I had in, in trying to do my own thing. And it was the fact of calming my mind and just letting it go, letting the ego get out of the way. It's still, believe me, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Trust me. But it always is. We all are. Yeah. And, and I'm able to forgive myself for not getting, because my, my thing is now it's not about money. It used to be about money for me. And it's not about money. It's about connecting with interesting people like you that, and it's not going to be my ideas. It's going to be your ideas that I, you know, my job is to connect interesting and intelligent people from all walks of life. I don't care how much money you make, what the color of your skin is, your gender, whatever. I don't give a flying shit. If you excuse my language, it's I want to connect people that are really interested in building these things to help move us forward. And that goes back to Quired. You'll move you forward. But I had to I had to spend 20 years to get around my mind on that to really figure out it was about just getting out there and talking about these things and meeting interesting people who can help build it. Yeah, Paul, and 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 yeah, absolutely, and I I love what you're doing, and and I, yes, that you are a connector, but your contribution is far more than that because you, you the way that you approach it, which is like you're balancing the masculine and the feminine, right? The masculine yes. and the feminine energies. You you've got this amazing, brilliant, logical, scientific, engineering systems mind, and you're also accessing your intuition. And, and other ways of knowing. And not only are you accessing it, but you're living it. And, and you're taking a stand and creating an opportunity for discussion in which that can continue forward. And, and that's what we need, right? If, if we expect for there to be balance in the world, it has to start within each one of us. And you're on your way to doing that. Like you're living that. I am. I am. And I appreciate it. And I have no expect. Another thing that Sharon would tell me about is manage your expectations. You know, I have no expectations of it. And you came on this Podmatch app and I, you know, I found about Podmatch and I didn't really know. And, you know, knowing my luck, because I haven't been able to get anybody on for a while. I've asked a number of people and and they haven't uh, got back with me. And I thought, OK, I'm going to try it. And it's just and I'd done a couple of meditations before that. And when you came in and said you're interested in the show, I wasn't expecting it whatsoever. And then I read the title. I was like, whoa, this is kind of a little bit weird because <laughs> of all the people, because I looked at all the, all the, uh, the people on, on the network on Podmatch, and uh, that's cool. I mean, not, not judging anybody, but I, I want to, no, I know I want to roll. I know. It's just like, just, what's a match for what you're doing and what's not a match. Yeah. And you came up and, and, and I started reading your books like, Oh my God, He's 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 talking the other side. I talk the technology. He's talking the back end of that, which is, you know, he could be relatable. And, you know, my one of my biggest weaknesses is that that relatability. I I get so caught up in my own mind that uh, I have a hard time. You know, people like you have to bring it out of me, to be honest with you, because I get so self-involved on these ideas that and you seem to be a type of a person with your retreats and things like that you can really make the human connection and i do think that's important is that of, of you know just engaging with somebody at that not so much cerebral but as an emotional level and that's the thing i think you'll help me with as i read your book to discover some more of those traits yeah yeah i love that and and, and i think you're right i think i think where we're longing to connect with each other is at a much deeper place that that is beyond logic and beyond understanding um and that is more in that realm of the stadium that doesn't have the same rules it has different laws of physics even um which we then translate because we don't have the language for it but we translate it like using words like miracles and magic um but 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 yeah i, th I think you're absolutely right and by the way i don't i don't have that impression of you like stuck in your head at all you've uh, like this conversation has been amazing and very connected 
and flowing very easily from one profound thought to another. So I, I beg to differ with your, with your perception of what you just said. Well, yeah. Um, well, I think you are very relatable. Yeah, I guess in the right set, you know, me at a bar, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just said my, it's my thing is that I, I'm not one to really chit chat. So I've, I've never had the ability to just go and talk about the weather or sports. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to get, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy this conversation. It's at my core. And, and I love to learn when I talk to people and I love to learn about their experiences and what they're offering. And, and so I think I have too much of an expectation that my son tells me, he's like, dad, can you just go, go talk to somebody and just chill? <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> my, my son, who's 20 years old is, is teaching me all these things as well, because, uh, you know, he just, you got to relax and, and, uh, it's hard for me to relax. So, uh, but you know, you one, know, and I'm like you too. It's like, I don't do, I don't do chit chat. I don't bullshit. I don't do BS. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't, ha I don't have time for that. When I meet somebody, I want to get to know who they are, what makes them tick, yeah. what they're passionate about, yes. what they're here for. Yeah. And I, and I, it is, it is, it's all lessons and we learn and we meet people that, you know, we met each other and, and uh, I'm learning. Uh, but one thing I want to say before we get off is that that baseball stadium analogy that you had was so incredibly powerful because I have my own story on that. Talking about my son who's 20 now, but back when he was probably 10 years old, we were at a baseball stadium. I'm not a big sports guy, but I thought it would be good to expose him to it. And um, <laughs> this is the way that dad thinks. I said, Vaughn, his name is Vaughn. Uh, I said, Vaughn, what do you see? All these people, there's, I think there's 28,000 people here. What do you see? He goes, dad, I don't know. What, what, what are you talking about? What are all these people? I see that guy eating popcorn. I said, no, I see potential. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when you say that about their baseball today, I mean, it is true. And when you're talking about the, the, the reference of, of the, of the baseball in the middle of the stadium is that, you know, every single person there has enormous potential and every one of them. And, you know, that, that, the idea about the ego is, is the baseball is just, it's so powerful to me about that. That kind of wraps up the whole story to me is about <laughs> the, you know, or the fact of us getting in our own way and, um, and, you know, using these tool sets, whether it's technology or just intuition and emotion that you're sharing, it's all the same thing. And I think that should be the, uh, the arc going forward is really fighting for these things and, and what you're doing and, and really what I'm doing. Exactly, exactly. Adam, I'm really excited to connect with you. Um, like what you're up to is intellectually and spiritually stimulating for me. Like I think what you and I could have kept on going for another hour oh, yeah, we could. Of, of conversation. <laughs> and, and I hope that we will because I, 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 I'd love to stay in touch and stay connected. And, and, you know, who knows? Who knows how we can be so how we can support each other and support the emergence yeah, great. Yeah. And I'd love to support what you're doing. And I, I think you're just getting into the, the very tip of, of where you're going to go with these things to, because it's, it's your power, your message is so incredibly powerful and so incredibly needed for the young men, the young women, especially mm, you talk, mm. I mean, I see some of these things that they're taking on the masculine, the, the bad side of masculine. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's so incredibly important to the things you're working on. So yes, I hope to stay in touch with you and, and absolutely. And I, Christian, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and, and how much I've learned from you and how much I appreciate it. I love that, Paul. I love the con the connection and the conversation, and and thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. All right, and maybe we'll have you on the show in the future as well, sometime, and and talk about some other things and deeper dive, and and we'll see what what shakes out. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Christian, and everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode, and we'll talk to you soon. <laughs>